Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you're watching this, I'm glad that you've come to watch Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School. We are thrilled to have you join us, and I hope that today will be a wonderful opportunity for you. We are today looking, as we make our way through the entire Bible, we started with Genesis, and today we are up to the book of Ephesians. And so we want to pay some special attention to the book of Ephesians and what it has to say to us and what kind of things it teaches us. The book of Ephesians is one of the most well-organized books uh, in the New Testament in the sense that the first three chapters are theological, the second three chapters are practical, and it's just, it's very, very clear as you read the text carefully, you will see that. A number of times. One of the ways to see it is that you look for commands called uh, imperatives in Greek. And these commands then uh, only show up in the fourth through the sixth chapter. I think there's one imperative in chapters one through three and like nine in chapters four through six. So you can see that Paul is laying the foundation for it in the first half and then essentially saying, now, as a result of all this theology, now here is what you're supposed to do. So we're going to look at that book today and learn a little bit more about it. You remember, if you remember much about Ephesus, that there was a riot that happened there earlier on in Paul's ministry. And the riot had to do with this, this Diana, the King James translates it, or Artemis, as other translations translate it. And uh, you remember that Paul had uh, told them that gods made with hands were no gods at all. And the silversmiths, many of whom made their living making small little tiny um, uh, icons like this, they, they, the silversmiths began to lose their method of earning a living. And as a result, they were very angry at, at Paul then they come into the Ephesian amphitheater, and for two hours they are shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so we'll look at that and think a little bit more about it. Here's the cartoon for this week. That's an E fishing, and he catches a bodybuilder. So when you try to remember Ephesians, you can remember an E fishing. And it's going to remind you that Paul wants to build up the body of Christ. He writes a letter to build up the body of Christ at Ephesus, or in Ephesus. And so the believer in Christ, life is lived on two planes, the theological one on one side and the practical one on the other. And so we are, we are a part of Christ's church positionally, but we, we are saved, and yet we are being saved in the, same, in, in the same sense. We're not there yet, but we will get there. So let's think about a few things about the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was, uh, and, and this will, later on, it, this will make a difference. But the city of Ephesus had these gods that I told you about. Artemis, the city was principally celebrated for its temple to Artemis. And Artemis was apparently something like a, a meteorite or something that had fallen and had been carved into the shape of a, a female with many, many breasts, as you saw earlier on. And so it was a particular god, particularly uh, designed and it was thought that this, this was the god of the city of Ephesus. And so not only was it a, a place where the god of Artemis was worshipped, but there was a lot of sorcery practiced in Ephesus. There's a, a piece of literature from the first century that tells about a wrestler and the wrestler was thought to be undefeated and undefeatable. And they find that he has a, 
a wristband on and they take it off and written inside the wristband were these magical papyri, these magical inscriptions. And he's just, you know, once that's taken off, of course he loses. But that kind of sorcery was connected with the city of Ephesus. Here you can see where Ephesus is. Ephesus, this is Rome here or Italy. And you can see how this is Ephesus up here. So it's not in Greece or Macedonia. It's, it's all the way up here. And Paul had gone there, apparently. Although there is some question because the book doesn't, it doesn't have the same, like Paul doesn't mention people by name in the book. He do, like he does in Romans or in Corinthians. He, he's no, nobody's mentioned by name. And as a result, there are some issues, and we'll talk about those in a minute. In terms of authorship, this is a great divide. Some, even critical scholars, will say that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, but most will not. Most will say, yeah, it's not what Paul wrote. So let's, let's look at, since this is the first book that we have come to, where there's a question about authorship, I thought it would be good for us to take a few minutes, not many, and just look carefully at what's going on there in terms of authorship. Uh, so there are arguments in favor of Paul having been the author. The epistle announces itself as having been written by Paul. So you will notice if you look at the book of Ephesians, you will notice at the very beginning of it that it will say, I was written by Paul. I, Paul, write to you. And so all of us then need to realize that there's something there. And if Paul didn't write this, then it creates for us some fairly significant problems, not insurmountable, I mean, it's possible that somebody gathered up Paul's notes, but I, I don't think that's the case. There's nothing in the book, in its contents, inconsistent with the assumption of his being the author. There's nothing in it that just right out says, this is not a book written by Paul. And all the incidental references agree with what is known to be true of Paul. So he had been there at Ephesus, he, uh, he had, you know, taken place in that riot and all of that. The style of the doctrines and the sentiments and the spirit and the way that the thing is written, the character revealed are those of Paul. So you don't want to just put this away as non-Pauline before you think it through and the whole church the whole all of the ancient church received it as genuine and thus received it as genuinely having been written by Paul so what does that tell us at the very least it tells us that those people who read Greek as their mother tongue didn't see the differences that modern scholars do. And I think there's, there's something to be said about that, that we can't, we, no, nobody today reads Greek as our mother tongue. As much as we have studied it, it's not the language with which we grew up and the language we grew up speaking. And it, it seems at least as if Paul if, if, if he hadn't written this and they had read other letters by him, they would have noticed that. But again, that's... So there are objections. One is that Paul was familiarly acquainted with the Ephesians. He knew them. He had been there. And this writer has only heard of their conversion and of their faith and love. So that's 
a bit problematic. It may be, though, that those people who had been converted were those that were not known to Paul. Uh, some argue that this epistle of Ephesians is a verbose imitation of the epistle to the Colossians. There are similarities between Ephesians and Colossians, without a doubt, no, no question about it. But that doesn't mean, in any sense of the word, that this is, Ephesians is merely a verbose uh, imitation. I think that that's crazy to say of the book of Ephesians that this is just a verbose imitation. It's a carefully, carefully constructed and written book. The epistle contains no reference to the, the circumstances in which the Ephesians find themselves. It may have been a while since Paul had been there, and that may answer all of these questions. So all of that to say, I believe that Paul wrote it. I believe what the text says. But you should be aware, at least, that a lot of people, a lot of scholars, New Testament scholars, don't believe that Paul wrote it. Let's move on. And uh, the, the, another objection is that the style is not that of Paul. This style is a very difficult thing to sort of get, get our hands on at times. Because think about your own writing. Would a letter written to one person be written in the exact same style as a paper that you wrote for graduate school? Certainly not. We all have the ability to change style depending upon our audience and our topic. And it's certainly someone as well-educated as the Apostle Paul would have had the same opportunity. This objection that it's the style isn't that of Paul is, is an objection that was urged by Bauer. Bauer is the B of the famous Greek lexicon B-A-D-G. Bauer, Art, Donker, and Gingrich. And Bauer was a German scholar who was critical and not, not a certainly not an evangelical by any stretch of the imagination. And he simply said that the epistle to the Ephesians contains Gnostic allusions. And he says Gnosticism didn't prevail until the 3rd or the 4th century. So as a result of that, he would argue that this book of Ephesians is much later than the rest of the New Testament. The problem with that argument is, I have in my office a copy of a manuscript from about 200 to 300 AD. And it is the end of Galatians and the beginning of Ephesians, which shows us several things. It shows us, one, that the book of Ephesians was thought to be by Paul very early, and it shows us that Paul's letters were being collected very early on. They were being put into some kind of a scroll or something like that. So this idea that, 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 that Ephesians is not written by Paul is not, in my mind at least, it's just not that strong of an argument. Now, there, there, it, it's much more technical than I have left with you this morning or this afternoon whenever you're watching this. It's much more technical than that, and there are questions about how many subclauses he uses per paragraph and all kinds of mathematical things like that. But it comes down to this question of style. And it just seems to me that style is so changing as one grows and as one gets more education that style is not a legitimate method of determining authorship. So we've decided that Paul has written the book, that he's the author. Now we have to ask the second question, and that is, a more difficult one, that is, to whom was the letter written? And if you look at Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 in your Bible, there will probably be a footnote there. And the footnote will have to do with the textual problem in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. It's a very famous textual problem. And 
in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, in some early manuscripts, the, the name in Ephesus or the two words in Ephesus are gone. And as to this point, there are really three different opinions as to what, what's going on here. The first is that it was addressed to the Ephesians. And then as a result, it's just it's a copious error somehow that slipped in there. Another is that it was addressed to the Laodiceans. The name comes from a canon list by Martian, I'm pretty sure. And uh, Martian lists this, these books that are in the New Testament canon, and in there is this book he calls Ephesians. But he also lists this book called The Letter to the Laodiceans. And we don't have that book. And so some have argued that this letter to the Laodiceans is what we call Ephesians. And others have argued that this was a circular letter. That, it was a, it, that is, it, was, it would be something like a, uh, a bulk email today. That Paul would leave a space and wherever the book was being read, you put the name of that church in there. And so it was a circular letter designed to go around to all of the different churches in, in that part of Asia Minor. Uh, that's, it's a difficult decision, I will tell you. Um, the, 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 the issue is one, as you look at Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, you can see how taking out in Ephesus sort of makes it a quirky way to read. So there are those who will argue that the term in Ephesus ought to be included in the text. And those who are being, uh, arguing that will argue that the epistle is directed to those who are in Ephesus and that this epistle was addressed to the Ephesians is proved by the testimony of the ancient church. Remember, the ancient church said, this is the letter to the Ephesians. And it took the letter to the Ephesians and accepted it. The, the uh, arguments in favor of a circular letter are that the lack of the words in Ephesus in the older manuscripts, they just don't show up. And the problem with this view as a circular letter is that the only manuscripts that have survived either have in Ephesus or nothing. We never see a manuscript with a letter to the church of the Laodiceans. It, it's not there. And so one would think that if this were a circular letter where the, where the name of the letter, the name of the church was being put in to a blank space, that we would find some of those manuscripts. But we don't. And it, we, we would expect that. We would expect the names of other churches to, to crop up. Another uh, big question is the epistle's relation to the book of Colossians. Clearly, there are similarities between e Colossians and Ephesians. Uh, one of the similarities is the occurrence in both epistles of the same words and forms of expression. So... If you're going to argue that it's a different style, you've got to somehow come up with some kind of a way that this happened and arguing that it's a, it's a fabrication that, that depended upon the book of Colossians, I think is short-sighted at best. There are passages which are identical in thought and language in Colossians and Ephesians. And... There are passages in which the thought is the same and the expression is varied. And so, as a result, this, this creates this question. In other passages where the same talk, topic is more fully handled than the, in the other epistle, than one, in one epistle than the other. So, there are points of similarity in terms of Ephesians and Colossians, but we would expect that. They're from the same person. He's talking about many of the same things, and as a result, it's important that they understand these things. But there are points of difference as well. Um, 
one of the points of differences is that while the epistle to the Colossians has indicated, has every indication of having been written to a particular congregation in reference to their particular issues and problems they were having in the church, the most marked characteristic of the epistle to the Ephesians the, is the absence of these features. There's nothing really personal in the book of Ephesians. In the epistle to the Ephesians, the doctrinal element prevails. So in the epistle to the Colossians, it's just the opposite. So keep that in mind as you sort through all of these things that the, one of the things that you want to look for is as you read through the book of Ephesians, one of the key words to the book is mystery. You'll see the word mystery more times in the book of Ephesians than virtually any other New Testament book. And the, the mystery today sort of means something different than it did then. In in our culture, mystery is a kind of novel that you buy at Barnes & Noble. You, got, you go to the mystery section. In Paul's day, a mystery was something that you could never understand on your own. A mystery was something that it, it, only God could reveal to you. And so the mystery that Paul is talking about is the mystery of God the Messiah coming down and dying to bring both Jewish and Gentile believers in him together. And that's the reason that we see in Ephesians, for example, he has torn down the wall of separation. No need to separate anymore because we have the one Messiah. The main object of the epistle to Colossians is to warn the church against philosophy, so-called. And there's no indication of anything like this in the book of Ephesians. It's just, it's not there. There are, therefore, topics discussed in one epistle that are not, there's nothing to correspond to them in the other epistle. So there's no sense in which we can fairly call the book of Ephesians a copy a poor copy of the book of, of Colossians. It's just not the case. And the order of sequence, except in the case of some particular exhortations, they're entirely different in the two. And so we all ought to, ought to realize that when we're dealing with the book of Ephesians, it has some very specific things to say to us. So let's look at a few of the key themes in the book of Ephesians. One theme is the greatness of God. In the first three chapters, you see that. And <clears throat> Paul begins with this soaring magisterial commitment to the grace of God. And then he moves on. Verses 4 through about 21 are all one long sentence there. And it's all about how great God is and what he's going to do for us. And then he begins later on to exalt Christ. And the, he, he talks about the status of believers in the Messiah. So in Christ occurs 34 times in the book. If you've read through the book of Ephesians and underlined every time in Christ occurs, you'll see it again and again and again. And, he, and what Paul is saying is that our, our being is in Christ. It's not in someone else. There is the unity of Jew and Gentile, as I've already talked to you about the, the nature of mystery and how that mystery can't be solved by the smartest person or by the hardest working person. The mystery is solved by the person who believes God, and God communicates that to him. And in, in Ephesians, the mystery is that God has united 
the Jews and the Gentiles rather than driving them apart. In the sixth chapter, we find the struggle with the powers of evil. One of the things that we see in the book of Ephesians is this, these statements about the, uh, the principalities and powers. They are thought to be, by most, thought to be evil beings, uh, not politicians, but evil, invisible beings, sort of uh, the evil one and his, his angels. And this struggle against the powers of evil is very clear in the book of Ephesians. Remember that it's the book of Ephesians where we find out about this armor, the armor of the Lord, the breastplate of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. All of that is, is very, very uh, important to defend ourselves against these evil beings. Then there's the ethical obligations of believers. So there are many, many imperatives, as I've already said, starting in chapter 4. You, you, you go through chapter 4, and you read through chapter 4, 5, and 6, and just underline the commands. And it'll be a little bit harder to tell in English at times, but you'll be able to find most of them. And you will see that Paul is saying, as a result of all the things that you've Learn theologically in the first three chapters, now here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to obey your parents. You're supposed to, uh, you know, treat your slaves kindly. You're supposed to treat your wife with respect, all those kinds of things. And then the church, this is its main theme. Remember in the early cartoon, we saw a guy bodybuilding, Paul is building up the body of Christ in the city of Ephesus. And that is significantly, critically important for us to realize. So in quick outline, just two points because, you, you, you know, there's three chapters and three chapters. The first three chapters is God's re- work of reconciliation in Christ. We're 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 in Christ. The second of the three chapters is living in response to God's work in Christ. How can we live in a way that will show those around us that we really are in Christ, that we really are Christians? That's what the book of Ephesians is about. It's not a long book. Six chapters. You could certainly read it in a half an hour or 45 minutes, depending on how quickly you read. And I think that you would get a lot of very helpful life tools from what the text has to say. So I hope that you'll take a few minutes, read Ephesians this week, and let it speak to you in a special, special way. Next week, we'll be dealing with Philippians and Colossians, depending on how it plays out. But I hope to see you then. Uh, For now, I hope that this quick look at the book of Ephesians has been helpful and that it has blessed you. And I hope that I will see you again next week at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School. Thanks so much for watching and may God bless you in a great and wonderful way. Thanks so much.